Starliner delays, Ariane 6 delays, and wait, what? Russia's launching their first moon mission in half a century? I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 11th of August, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Starliner faces new delays after the most recent media update from NASA and Boeing earlier this week. During a media event on Monday, both NASA and Boeing confirmed that Starliner's crew flight test would not occur until next year. In particular, Boeing does not expect the spacecraft to be ready until at least March of 2024. Now, if you remember, in June, the company and NASA had announced that they'd discovered issues with Starliner's parachute softlinks. Boeing had also discovered that the tape used for wiring harnesses was flammable under certain circumstances. Now, the work solving these issues has already been underway for a while, with a parachute drop test with the new softlink scheduled for November. A good part of the tape has also been removed and is being replaced as well. While Boeing expects Starliner to be ready by March of 2024, it's also important to keep in mind that this does not reflect the actual launch date for the crewed test flight. For that, both NASA and Boeing will have to take into account the ISS visiting vehicle schedule, as well as the schedule from the launch provider, United Launch Alliance. It definitely seems like Starliner won't fly crew until well into next year. Starliner isn't the only one seeing delays. ESA and Ariane Space shared this week the latest update and timeline for Ariane 6's debut flight, which is also now scheduled for 2024. Both ESA and Ariane Space released a call for the media to apply for upcoming events related to the Ariane 6 rocket, including an all-important, long-duration hot fire test. We tend to refer to these as static fires. Along with the press release was also some important information about the test timeline for Ariane 6, including confirmation that the rocket's debut flight won't happen until next year. On the one hand, a qualification Ariane 6 rocket is undergoing testing at French Guiana, where Ariane Space has been using it for ground testing of the rocket and launch pad interfaces. So far, this has included the testing of the countdown without and with propellants loaded on board, as well as the ignition of the main chamber of the rocket's Vulcan 2.1 engine. Now, this latest test was done on July 18th, which was also planned to include a four second long burn of that engine. But this test had to be postponed as the operations had run for so long that the ground tanks were running out of the liquid oxygen to replenish the rocket. Ariane Space says that now they'll try this short firing test on August 29th, followed by a long firing test on September 26th. Now, on the other hand, qualification testing of the rocket's second stage still continues at Lampoldhausen in Germany. A long hot fire qualification test of this stage was scheduled to also occur in July, but it had to be postponed due to software issues. So this test is now scheduled to take place on September 1st, and if successful, will qualify Ariane 6's second stage systems for flight. All in all, it's certainly not been an easy road for Ariane 6, but hopefully by the end of September, both ESA and Ariane Space will have a better idea of when Europe's new heavy lift rocket will be able to launch. Now let's take a look at this week in launches. Spoiler alert, there's a ton of them. Starting off the week was a Falcon 9 taking off on August 7th at 2.41 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. It was carrying another batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit as part of the Starlink Group 68 mission. The first stage, B-1078, was flying for a fourth time and successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. This mission broke the pad turnaround record by over five hours, with this launch happening just three days, 21 hours, and 41 minutes after the previous one. A Soyuz 2.1B with a frigate upper stage lifted off on August 7th at 1320 UTC from the Plisets Cosmodrome in Russia. The rocket was carrying the GLONASS K2 number 13L satellite into medium Earth orbit. The GLONASS satellites are Russia's equivalent of the GPS system. This was the first launch of the new GLONASS K2 satellite, an upgraded satellite version which is set to be 70% heavier and have 170% more power than the previous version. Now this launch was of particular interest for those in Southeast Australia. The third stage of the Soyuz rocket re-entered over that area of the ocean after pushing the frigate upper stage into space and near orbital speeds. This left a trail in the sky that was seen by thousands of people. It was quite a show. Another launch with great views, though not at liftoff, was this Falcon 9 that took off on August 8th at 3.57 UTC from Vandenberg in California. 
The rocket was carrying a batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The launch was carried out an hour after sunset, which meant that the second stage flew into sunlight right after stage separation and, as it flew further southeast, it entered into sunset again, which we could see from the second stage cameras. Really amazing. The first stage for this mission, B-1075, was flying for a fifth time and it landed successfully on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. A Changzhong 2C rocket lifted off on August 8 at 2253 UTC from the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center in China. It carried the Huanjing 2F satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. The Huanjing 2F satellite is the seventh of China's Huanjing series of satellites aimed for disaster and environmental monitoring. This one in particular sports a synthetic aperture radar antenna capable of 5-meter resolution imaging. This Series 1 rocket lifted off on August 10th at 4.03 UTC from Site 95A at the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. It carried seven payloads into a sun-synchronous orbit as part of the Lucky 7 mission. As is usual for sun-synchronous orbits, the seven payloads, while for different customers, are all Earth imaging satellites. This was the seventh launch of Series 1, which makes it one of China's most reliable commercial rockets so far. This week we also had what is perhaps Russia's most important launch of recent memory. This Soyuz 2.1B lifted off on August 10th at 2310 UTC from the Vostochny Cosmodrome in Russia. The rocket carried the Luna 25 spacecraft into a translunar injection trajectory. Luna 25 is Russia's first lunar mission in 47 years, and it's the country's first attempt to restart its lunar program. If all goes well, Luna 25 is set to land on the Bogoslavsky crater near the southern region of the moon about 10 days after launch. Another Falcon 9 launch also took place this week from Florida on August 11th at 5.17 UTC. It carried another batch of Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit as part of the Starlink Group 6-9 mission. The first stage for this mission, B-1069, was flying for a ninth time and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. This week, we also saw Virgin Galactic conducting its second paying commercial flight with a successful Galactic O2 mission. Takeoff of VSS Unity under its mothership plane VMS Eve took place on August 10th at 1429 UTC from Spaceport America in New Mexico. Once again, our own Jack Byer traveled to the spaceport to capture the event as it happened. VSS Unity was released from VMS Eve about 50 minutes later at 1517 after being flown up to an altitude of approximately 45,000 feet. Unity was carrying six people, as usual, two pilots and four passengers in the back. The commander was Frederick Sturkow, who was flying for a fourth time on Spaceship Two after having flown another four times on the space shuttle. The other pilot, Kelly Latimer, was flying for her first time and became VSS Unity's first female pilot. Of the four passengers on board Unity, one was Virgin Galactic's flight instructor Beth Moses, who was flying for her fourth time. Along with her was John Goodwin, the first Olympian to travel to space, and the second person with Parkinson's to travel to space. He was one of the first people to purchase a ride on Spaceship Two, and now he had the chance to finally fly on it. For context on the wait, John purchased his ticket the same year that this video's editor was born. The other two passengers were Keisha Shahoff and her daughter Anastasia Myers, who have become the first mother and daughter to travel to space. They've also become the first female space traveler from the Caribbean and the youngest person to fly into space, respectively, according to Virgin Galactic. They both won the chance to fly on Spaceship Two through a fundraiser contest from nonprofit Space for Humanity. VSS Unity flew to an altitude of 88 kilometers before gliding to a safe landing on the spaceport's long runway at 1533 UTC. So far, Virgin Galactic is maintaining a regular one-month launch cadence, so hopefully we'll see them fly again in September. This week, Rocket Lab released an important update regarding its rockets and its financials, and it was pretty much what Wall Street was expecting. As part of the company's second quarter investor call, Rocket Lab reported a revenue growth of 12% year over year, going up to $62 million. This was also the first quarter where the company's launch business had made more money than it spent, creating a gross profit of $5 million. During the presentation, Rocket Lab also explained some of the latest design changes for Neutron, which included the larger stance landing legs and the switch from four to two sections for the fairing. 
According to the company CEO Peter Beck, the new legs allow for more stability in case of barge landings, something that has been requested by customers seeking more performance out of Neutron. I guess marine assets don't suck anymore, right, Peter? Marine assets suck, like 100% <laughs> suck. The reduced number of sections for the fairing also allows simpler mechanisms to open, release, and then close the fairing again, which minimizes complexity and mass. Rocket Lab has also recently completed a Neutron Stage 2 carbon composite qualification tank, which will be tested to simulate flight conditions. In that same presentation, the company announced 10 new launches for Electron, including 5 for Black Sky, 2 for Synspective, and a haste launch expected to take place in 2024. As you can see, Rocket Lab is really busy these days, and knock on wood, it appears that their financial situation is in better shape than some of the rest of the small sat market. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Booster 9 has rolled back to the production site at Starbase right after its static fire test that took place last Sunday. It's thought that this is an order to work on it after the test was cut short and also featured four engines shutting down prematurely. It's also hoped that this work might include the installation of a hot staging ring for the vehicle to sport on its return back to the launch site, hopefully in the not-too-distant future. For the full rundown of news at Starbase, keep your eyes peeled for next week's Starbase update. Axiom Space has signed an agreement with ESA and Poland to fly a Polish astronaut to the ISS on the Axiom 4 mission next year. This comes right on the heels of another agreement between Axiom and ESA to fly Swedish astronaut Marcus Vant on the Axiom 3 mission. It definitely seems like ESA is finding a good use case for these commercial flights to the International Space Station. And, as a bonus, it doesn't take up space on NASA's contracted crew rotations. This week, Jared Isaacman shared some updates on Twitter about the Polaris program. This included confirmation of good progress on Resilience, the Crew Dragon capsule to fly on Polariston, as well as work on the EVA suit for the mission. He also hinted at more updates for the second Polaris mission by the end of the summer, so I guess we'll have to keep an eye on whatever comes out then. India's Chandrayaan-3 robotic lunar landing mission is now in lunar orbit, arriving on Saturday, August 5th. As of recording, the spacecraft is in a 174 by 1,437 kilometer orbit around our nearest neighbor. It'll drop its orbit further over the next few days in preparation for landing, currently targeted to occur on August 23rd. Firefly has unveiled its new Elytra Space Tug, which is the new name for the company's orbital transfer vehicle. Building on the experience from the company's Alpha Rocket, its Blue Ghost Lander, and Spaceflight Inc.'s Sherpa Tug, Elytra will be able to place payloads into different orbits. Its first mission is set to take place in January of 2024. Firefly is planning up to three configurations, Elytra Dawn, dedicated to low Earth orbit rideshares, Elytra Dusk, dedicated to bring payloads from low Earth orbit to geostationary orbit, and Elytra Dark, dedicated to bring payloads from low Earth orbit into lunar orbit and beyond. So you notice how each name is a later time of day and how it corresponds to a distance further from the Earth? Well, that's what folks in the biz call branding. And now let's go over next week in spaceflight. A Kwajo 1A rocket is set to launch on August 13th at around 535 UTC from the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in China. As it is usual with these Chinese launches, the payload is currently unknown. Next week, we'll also have back-to-back -back Starlink launches with the first one taking place from Florida within a six-hour window that opens on August 16th at 2342 UTC. The second one is set to take place from Vandenberg a few hours later on August 17th at around 7 o'clock UTC. And that's your weekly update of Spaceflight News. We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in Spaceflight.